Well, hello everybody and welcome back to Solid Gold with a brand new series. As I have covered in the last two years, the coastline in North Yorkshire and then uh, the Northumberland coast, um, I decided that there was a big gap in the middle the area of uh, Tyne and Weir and the Durham coastline. So I just thought it fitting really to address that and cover those areas. Now, I wouldn't say it's an area of outstanding beauty as far as the coastline goes um, because of its industrial past. So this series isn't so much about the beaches um, and the stunning coastline. It's more about the historical content. Um, and as I said, that is quite involved and covers quite a lot of history. So that is what this series is going to be about. Technically speaking, Seton Sluice sits on the north edge of the boundary of Tyne and Weir and Northumberland. Because of the frequent boundary switches over the decades, and though it physically sits on the Northumberland side of the boundary today, its history lies to the south of the boundary with the locations of Tyne and Weir. And that is why it's included in this series and wasn't included in the Northumberland series I did last year. So please, all you boffins out there, don't write to me and point out that I've got it wrong, that Seton Sluice is part of Northumberland, because that is the reason why. Its name Seton is derived from the words sea town and the sluice element is because there used to be a set of sluice gates on the mouth of the old harbour which is just along as the river bends around that curve. Although prehistoric settlements existed here as far back as Mesolithic times it is the medieval period of the 1100s that the recorded history begins here. Back then it was known as Hartley Pans due to a thriving salt industry. The small river that forms its estuary here is known as Seton Burn. Remember, a small river in these parts is called a burn. There is a town um, called Seaton Burn and it's situated seven miles inland from here on the north edge of Newcastle City. Um, and ironically enough, it's right adjacent to the source of the Seaton Burn. A rock headland which is behind me um, is known as Crag Point and it caused the river to bend sharply on its way out to sea. This made it difficult for boats to navigate the narrow harbour entrance and of course a thriving salt industry needed a working port. I'll come back to the subject of the harbour shortly, but next I need to digress slightly to explain the history of the area and then we'll return to this um, section. And we digress back to the period of the Anglo-Scottish Wars. An appeal tower was built during that period on the rise just above Seton Sluice and it's built somewhere in the region of the Church of Our Lady which sits today in the grounds of Seton Delaval Hall and it was called Seton Castle. 
During the Tudor period, a manor house was added to the side of the tower. During that period, it was occupied by the de Laval family. The grand mansion known as Seton Delaval Hall, today owned by the National Trust, replaced Seton Castle and took nine years to build between 1718 and 1727. It was designed by Sir John Vanborough, the architect who built Blenheim Palace near Oxford, and it was built for Admiral and Lord George de Laval. Sadly, both died before the hall was finished. The de Laval family originated in the valley of Mayenne, which lies between Rennes and Limon in France. Guy de Laval, the name means Guy of the Valley, built a castle called Laval and today there is a large town there bearing the same name. The de Lavals came across with William the Conqueror in 1066 and once again, just like the Grey family of Howick, fought in the Battle of Hastings alongside William. As with the Grey family, the de Lavals, um, for their support and loyalty, were granted lands in the south of England by William the Conqueror. The son of Guy de Laval married the niece of William the Conqueror. So once again, just like the Greys, had close connections with the monarch of the day. The Delavals, as they were called by the local people, had a passion for acting and several of the family members appeared in Othello in the Drury Lane Theatre in London. Sir Francis Blake Delaval, who lived at the hall with his brother from 1727 to 1771, were renowned for being practical jokers. They would place trapdoors beneath the beds of their guests, who, once asleep, would be plummeted into a tank of cold water placed beneath. Another prank was to wait until their guests were undressed and without their wigs before going to bed. So once their guests were derobed, the brothers then removed a false wall using a system of pulleys to reveal them to their guests in the adjoining room. Another of the brothers' favourite pranks has been recreated in one of the bedrooms at Delaval Hall by the National Trust during the recent refurbishment of the hall. Again, using pulleys and false walls, the sleeping guests would wake to find the room upside down, with them apparently on the ceiling and the furniture above them on the upturned floor. They became known as the Wicked Delavals and a huge fire at the hall in 1752 could quite well have been one of their pranks gone wrong. The last Delaval to live at the hall was Edward Hussey Delaval, the third son of Francis Blake Delaval. Edward had a daughter called Sarah, but no sons. So after his death in 1814, the Delaval name in England ended. The family is still present in France and Ireland. The hall was then inherited by Sir Jacob Astley, Edward's nephew. A second, more ferocious fire happened in 1822 
this time caused by crows nesting in the chimneys. The central hall was completely gutted. Although it was re-roofed, it was never restored fully. The Astley family continued to live in the west wing of the hall until the 22nd Baron Edward Astley died in 2007. The 23rd Baron, Thomas Harold Astley, sold the hall to the National Trust in 2009. He is now a farmer and businessman living in Norfolk but has continued the Delaval trait for acting. He played the part of Cameron Fraser in the long-running radio drama, The Archers. So now we will return to Seton Sluice. Between 1660 and 1676, Sir Ralph de Laval installed a small pier for boats to dock but the harbour entrance went dry at low tide and continually silted up. The harbour is just around the corner but you can see it more clearly here from above. His solution was to build sluice gates at the harbour mouth trapping huge volumes of seawater at high tide. This was then released at low tide, flushing the harbour clear. Obviously, this is how the village became known as Seton Sluice. John Hussey Delaval, the first son of Francis Blake Delaval and nephew to Admiral George Delaval, owned considerable lands throughout Northumberland and Lincolnshire. He established coal mines in the neighbouring village of Hartley and a bottle making works. The port, even with the sluice gates, was not able to meet the demands he required. So he commissioned a channel to be cut through the sandstone headland, Crag Point. If I just step to one side, you can see the beginning of that channel there just behind me. The channel was 900, or it still is 900 feet long and 52 feet deep, allowing Seton Burn to travel to the sea in a straight line for the first time and making Crag Point an island for the first time. The cut could be sealed off at high tide, keeping the water level in the harbour to remain high to give more time for loading the cargo onto the waiting ships. This now allowed the port to flourish and a combination of coal, salt, glass and iron were exported from this tiny harbour. In fact, I'm actually standing on the harbour side where most of the glass was exported from. The glassworks were situated in the neighbouring village of Hartley and John Delaval employed German craftsmen from Nienburg to train the local people. The coal was exported from here down to London in a small sailing vessel called a collier. On their return journey here to pick up their next cargo, they would have been empty and that would have made them very vulnerable to the very unpredictable North Sea. So what they used to do was fill up with ballast, something that would keep the ship stable on its journey north and that ballast used to be sand or chalk or both. Um, obviously when they arrived here they needed to unload that ballast and the hill here is called Ballast Hill because what it is is all of that spoil ballast that came out of the collier ships 
so that they could then reload with coal and set off back for London. By 1760, Seton Sluice had eclipsed Blythe in the value of its exports. A custom house was built in 1720 near the harbour. It is an unusual octagon shaped building. It is thought to have been designed by Sir John Vanborough. At the same time, Seton Delaval Hall was built. Today it is the Tower Gallery displaying local works of art from local artists. The salt trade here ceased around 1820, but the glassworks continued another 50 years. The ports in Blythe and Newcastle were able to accommodate larger ships and consequently trade through Seton Sluice began to die out. A watchtower situated on the headland at Crag Point was built in 1880 as a lookout station for the Seton Sluice Volunteer Lifesavers. You will recall from the Northumberland Coast series, there was a great surge in providing sea rescue stations after Grace Darling's daring rescue in 1838. Many coastal towns established lifeboat stations from 1840 onwards. Once the RNLI was formed, the watchtower became a coast guard station. During that period, the headland was crowded with houses. Today, only one house remains and the watchtower is a museum to its past. And I think you can just see that over my shoulder there in the background. Three pubs dominate the village, each named after family members of Delaval Hall. The Waterford Arms is named after Marchioness Susanna Waterford, the granddaughter of Edward Delaval. The Melton Constable is named after the Astley family, who were from Melton Constable who inherited the hall after Edward Delaval's death. The third pub is the Astley Arms on the north edge of the village, obviously named after the Astley family, the last owners of Delaval Hall. A fourth public house sits on the headland overlooking the harbour and is the oldest of them all, built in 1786. It was originally built as the overseer's house. An overseer would make sure the workers were carrying out their tasks correctly and working to rule. It later became a hotel called the King's Hotel before changing again to a coaching inn and finally adopting its current name of the King's Arms. It has an excellent reputation for food, so booking ahead is advised to avoid disappointment. It also has a display of World War II submarine memorabilia at the back of the pub. Seton Sluice has good parking, a wonderful beach which joins up with South Beach at Blythe to the north, the small harbour provides moorings for several small private boats nowadays. As I said at the start of this episode, Seton Sluice began with the name of Hartley Pans. The village of Hartley is right next door to Seton Sluice on its south side. It is difficult to differentiate the two settlements and to most people it is all one place. But it's Hartley that we're going to visit next. So 
as it has become my one of my trademarks now, I will leave you with the views of Seaton Sluice. Uh, and I'll see you all again at the next location.
Well, hello again. And here we are in a place called Hartley. Um, as I explained at the last location of Seaton Sluice, the original settlement here was all one at one time, and it was called Hart Law. This means Stag Hill, and it comes from a mix of Old English or Anglo-Saxon and the even older Scottish Celtic language. Hart means stag and the law is from the Scottish dialect meaning a hill or high ground. In England's medieval history Hartley belonged to Adam of Jesmond who was the Sheriff of Newcastle during the reign of King John. John was the youngest son of King Henry II and Eleanor of Aquitaine. By marrying they had built up a powerful empire known as the Angevin Empire. John being the youngest son stood to inherit nothing on his father's death and was often mocked by his father as John Lackland. His older brother Richard I, of course, once he became king, went off to fight the Crusades. On Richard's return from the Crusades, um, on the journey back, he was captured and John saw his opportunity to grab the throne pronouncing that his brother had gone missing and presumed dead. Of course, John was not a popular king, just the same as his father had been disliked for being greedy for wealth and power. John needed to keep order of his lands, and so this was how Adam of Jesmond was given control of Newcastle and the south of Northumberland. Adam too seized the moment, realising that by supporting this unpopular king, he too could gain wealth and power. So they both supported each other. But just as King John was corrupt, so was Adam of Jesmond. He was hugely disliked by the local people. When King John died of dysentery in 1216, Adam quickly made an ally with John's son, Henry III, and went off to fight in the Ninth Crusade in an attempt to gain more wealth and a better position. He was killed during the Crusade and his lands, including Hartlaw, were conveyed to the De La Valles. This is the point in history where Seton Sluice began to be differentiated from Hartley. Coal was mined in Hartley from the medieval period at Hartley Colliery. The mine was particularly prosperous from 1700 onwards. That prompted a new mine to be sunk nearby called Hester Pit. New houses were built around this new mine for the workers. It was called New Hartley and the original settlement on the coast became Old Hartley. The new pit too was very prosperous until it befell a tragic accident in 1862. Mines at this time were privately owned and most paid little attention to the safety of its workers. This was seen as a waste of time and money. Hester Pitt had only one shaft which was divided down the centre. One side had the winding gear which lifted the workers up and down and the other side was used for ventilation and pumping the water out of the mine. Above the shaft was a steam engine attached to a 43 tonne beam. This beam had been repaired 
only one week prior to this accident. In the early morning of Thursday, January the 16th, 1862, 200 men and boys were just finishing a night shift and 200 others were just about to begin the day shift. As the first eight men ascended the shaft in the cage, the beam snapped, falling down the shaft on top of the men below. The beam destroyed the structure of the shaft as it fell, taking huge amounts of debris with it. Five of the eight men in the cage fell to their death, while the other three managed to hang on to the chains which had suspended the cage. They were eventually rescued, but all of the others were now trapped underground. The trapped men and boys all managed to move to the highest coal seam to wait for a rescue. Now that the pump was destroyed, the mine would quickly fill with seawater, carbon monoxide and methane gas. The men at the surface who were about to start work frantically began trying to clear the shaft. There were literally tons and tons of steel, rubble, rocks and timber blocking the shaft. As news spread, the records show that over 60,000 people gathered at the pit head to watch and wait in case of any good news. It took the rescuers seven days to break through the shaft to the men below which was the following Wednesday. Not one had survived. A total of 204 men and boys, some as young as 10 years old, had perished underground. Not that the rescuers could have known that, but those trapped were all dead within 24 hours by the Friday. The first man to break through was a guy called William Adam from nearby Coopen. He returned to the surface with the bad news and was totally distraught with emotion at what he had seen. The task of recovering the bodies was a long and unpleasant process. Many cottages next to the pit were filled with the coffins. The funeral procession was so long, it stretched from Hartley all the way to Erzden Church, some five miles, where all those lost were buried. It proved to be one of the worst mining disasters in the Northumberland and Durham region. In 1865, the Mines Act was passed through Parliament, which enforced all mines in England to have more than one shaft to prevent such an accident ever happening again. Hester Pitt never reopened following the accident. However, Old Hartley Pitt continued successfully until 1959. Today, the site of that ill-fated mine shaft is a memorial garden which was opened in 1976 and in 2012, a memorial pathway was installed recalling all those who had lost their lives that day. On the rocky cliff tops overlooking Colliwell Bay is Charlie's Garden. It's named after a man called Charles Dockray who cultivated a garden there. At the south end of the village is the Delaville Arms built in 1748 as a coaching inn. 
It was built next to a manor house known as Hartley Manor, but today it is no longer there. Just in front of the pub lies the Hartley Blue Stone, a huge chunk of windstone. Windstone is an igneous rock coming from volcanic or seismic activity. I'm not sure whether this lump came from the windsill, which outcrops at several places through Northumberland, or whether it was deposited here by the glaciers of the Ice Age. However, it is recorded as being here in Hartley since Anglo-Saxon times, and is said to have marked the centre of the village back then. It also may have been a boundary stone. Boundary stones have been used throughout history from the very early prehistoric times to mark a boundary. Sometimes just one stone and in other places a collection of stones, i.e. stone circles and the like. This one probably was positioned here next to where the manor house used to be. The name blue stone is not a reference to its colour, but to its uses. In Saxon England, it was spelt blue stone with an EW, as its original and intended purpose was as an oath stone. Oath stones are deeply rooted in ancient Celtic tribal traditions. Swearing an oath on a stone was thought to be the best way to express a solemn promise. It was seen as having a connection to ancestors and the earth, a way of securing your future in the wisdom of the past. It is where the expression to set something in stone comes from. The idea being that if you swore on an oath stone, then you had to keep that promise. Of course, in some regions and traditions, this is still a strong belief, as in humanistic weddings, for example, where the couple swear their vows on an oath stone. In the 1300s, the local people believed by touching the stone, you would be protected from the plague. Later, the tradition grew that you needed to kiss the stone to become a permanent resident of Hartley. One such resident, William Carr, was born on the 3rd of April 1756 and grew to be a giant of a man. He was known locally as the Hartley Hercules. He regularly demonstrated his strength by lifting the stone. It's estimated to weigh 220 kilograms. After World War II, most of Old Hartley Village was demolished and the stone was buried. In 1973, a new road was being built and the stone was uncovered. The Borough Council decided to reinstate the stone as close to the original location as possible. It now sits on this plinth outside the Delaval Arms. In the decades leading up to the First World War, it was planned to build a railway station um, between Hartley and Seton Sluice, um, and it was um, set to be called Colliwell Station. Um, just over here behind me is Colliwell Bay. So, as I say, the station was set to be um, to have that name. However, the First World War came along, and um, this station was never completed or commissioned. All that is left today is the um, embankment where the railway line was due to come and the bridge pier which was meant to come over Hartley Lane 
um, but again it was never completed um, and as I say this is all that's left of it today. That's all the news from here in Old Hartley. As usual I will leave you with some views of the area and I will see you in a few moments.
Well, that's all for this particular episode. If you've enjoyed it, give it a like, subscribe if you haven't already done so, and don't forget to hit that bell icon, and that is to receive notifications of any future posts. I'm off now a little further south to the very iconic seaside town of Whitley Bay. So I will see you all there in the next episode very soon. Goodbye for now.